welcome everybody. Thank you so much for spending some of your Friday morning with us here at TEA. We really appreciate your time. We promise to make good use of it. This is our August 11th FG meeting and we have an action packed agenda as always. So we won't spend uh, too much time up front, but do want to <clears throat> Marco, can you click to the next slide for me? Okay, housekeeping, and I'm getting a, your internet is unstable, so y'all wave at me if, if I go um, silent on you or freeze, um, but just some general housekeeping. Keep in mind, this meeting is being recorded. We do post these on the website, so folks who aren't able to join can access them. Um, remain on mute if you are not speaking. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. It's always wonderful to see your faces, so please stay on camera if possible. Um, and it really helps us track um, uh, our stakeholders. If you could add your name and organization um, in the Zoom box. Um, and then uh, while we want everyone to actively participate, let's make sure we monitor our time so uh, the whole group has an equitable opportunity to have their voice heard. Today, uh, it's short but dense, if I, if I, that's kind of how I would put it. So we're going to do some standards and testing updates with DeMarco, uh, talk through the Effective Preparation Framework 1.0 and Next Steps. Super excited about the progress there. Then we'll walk through the Chapter 228 discussion item from the last SBEC meeting, share some general updates related to um, uh, the EPF and residencies. We've merged those that three-lane highway to one um, comprehensive uh, item, and then we will take your questions. Uh, we should have a good amount of time for all this. Shouldn't feel rushed, but certainly uh, want to get right to it. So I will pass the mic to DeMarco to do a standards and testing update. DeMarco. Thanks, Emily. Good morning, everyone. I'm excited to uh, kick off our content for today's FG meeting with some standards and testing updates. Okay, and we're going to start by uh, doing a recap of the SBEX July discussion um, related to the teacher performance assessment. Um, so just to ground the group, the SBEX has been involved in really robust conversations and decision-making related to the a teacher performance assessment as a certification exam. Uh, as a reminder, at the February meeting, the SBEX did decide to move forward with implementation of uh, TPA options in the 26-27 academic year. And then in April, they decided to move forward with the development of a Texas-specific TPA. That meant in July, uh, we had the opportunity to really bring forward a discussion uh, related to the, the progress of the procurement processes related to the development of a Texas TPA, and also uh, share input from stakeholders related to the essential components of the uh, potential Texas-specific teacher performance assessment. So that centered uh, our conversation with the SBEC in July. To help inform that SBEC conversation in July, we facilitated three stakeholder vision setting work sessions uh, with our EdTPA pilot programs, uh, a few of our FG members, and then also F our LEA partners uh, as well. These stakeholder sessions took place in June. Um, and during these sessions, our participants were provided with uh, the components for uh, potential components for a Texas specific teacher performance assessment, uh, in addition to some aligned reflection questions to really get their thinking. As you can see on the screen here, these were the four different uh, components uh, or parameters, if you will, uh, that we provided to the stakeholders during those vision setting work sessions. These parameters were are an outcome of SBEC feedback and feedback that we heard from the field around what exactly would be needed to develop a Texas specific teacher performance assessment. Um, so as you can see, we have these four buckets of general parameters, uh, which includes a sum, this is a summative assessment intended for certification, 
teacher candidates are required to demonstrate best practices in Texas classrooms and analyze their practices against a set of SBEC approved standards in TPA content. Um, we're looking for this assessment to allow for evaluation of candidate proficiency in the general pedagogical and content pedagogical standards and grade band specific practices. In addition to including a demonstrated understanding of the Texas Code of Ethics. In terms of a TPA structure, um, the parameters include including multiple samples of candidates demonstrated evidence of instructional planning and delivery, allowing for multiple student samples of learning and reflective practices, allowing for evidence of professionalism and evidence of family and community engagement, and uh, really looking to produce concrete and specific data that would help inform candidate and EPP improvement. And then the final bucket of parameters uh, is related to TPA scoring criteria and submission processes. Um, and this looks like externally evaluated, having the assessment be externally evaluated by trained and calibrated reviewers, uh, evaluated against a norm rubric or set of rubrics, um, and then finally submission via an online platform. Of course, each group of stakeholders had uh, their thoughts and opinions and concerns related to those parameters and the development um, of the Texas specific teacher performance assessment. And we shared the breadth of that feedback captured during those vision setting work sessions with the SPEC. And you can find that in attachment three of item 15 on the July agenda. Um, but while they had differing thoughts and opinions, they also had many areas of uh, consensus that you see on the screen here, starting with TPA content. Um, each group of stakeholders felt that, you know, the assessment should be aligned with educator standards and evaluate instructional planning, delivery, and learning envir environment. It should be an authentic demonstration of the candidate's understanding of the Texas Code of Ethics um, through a performance assessment. Now, we also, while they wanted this to happen, the, the demonstration, the of the Texas Code of Ethics in this assessment, they also recognized that this could pose uh, a significant challenge and really worked with TEA staff to brainstorm what that could look like um, for the candidate and ensure that they are still assessed on that Code of Ethics. Um, we had consensus around the exam not creating undue burdens on our candidates. I think as someone who um, works in the realm of certification exams, that is never the goal. Um, and so it was, you know, I really resonated with the group for naming that this assessment, you know, should be should not be something that creates a barrier. Um, this assessment should serve as an opportunity to streamline current certification exam content and allow for multiple forms of clearly defined and normed evidence. In terms of TPA structure, this exam should include a candidate's demonstrated professionalism uh, through their communication and interaction with students, colleagues, families, and community. And then lastly, this should be an externally scored uh, assessment and provide specific rubrics uh, for the candidate and the EPP with an eye towards continuous improvement. At the end of all of our conversations with stakeholders, there were a few wonderings from the groups that we shared with the SBEC, specifically around if the Texas specific TPA was content and grade band specific, what exactly would be the implications for content pedagogy exam design or requirements? And I would say um, this wondering is really an outcome of the concern uh, for us not to create additional barriers for candidates. And then another wondering from our stakeholders, um, what role, if any, should the assessment play as a development tool for candidates? Um, we heard that loud and proud, especially from our LEA partner stakeholder group. Um, during the meeting, we did recommend to the SBEC to move forward with the development of a grade bandit content specific, Texas specific teacher performance assessment aligned to the parameters provided, really recognizing that content pedagogy exams allow for the candidate um, to highlight their content knowledge within a classroom uh, classroom scenario, and that the teacher performance assessment allows for them to demonstrate or activate that content knowledge within uh, a Texas classroom with Texas students. At the end of our conversation with 
uh, the ESPEC. The board directed TEA staff to move forward with the development of a grade banded content specific teacher, Texas specific, lots of specifics, y'all, uh, teacher performance assessment aligned to the parameters of provided. Um, and then they also asked staff to consider how to streamline content and grade, and grade bands as much as possible, um, how to allow data sharing and communication with districts that support candidate growth post-certification. Um, they also asked for staff to consider how to incorporate a candidate's demonstrated knowledge of working with special populations, um, really with an eye toward our bilingual students and our special education kiddos as well. Um, and then lastly, consider how to assess a candidate's application of a student's IEP in a classroom setting. In terms of next step, next steps with uh, the development of a Texas specific TPA, we are moving forward with the procurement of IHEs to develop the content of the TPA and also plan to continue engagement with stakeholders at each stage of the development, really recognizing that Stakeholders are at the heart uh, of this development process. And so every chance that we get to tap into your brilliance and your ideas um, and your expertise, that we will take that opportunity. This is a, a shameless plug here to ensure that if you have not already um, signed up to be part of the FG working group, I would say now is a great time, especially with this um, huge assessment coming down the pipeline. And then lastly, we do plan to share consistent updates to the ESPEC throughout the development process to ensure um, that they have opportunities to converse and discuss around uh, the progress of that assessment. Shifting worlds just a bit, um, but still within the same universe, if you will, we do have additional opportunities for stakeholder engagement coming up related to our special education and bilingual education state, uh, fields. Um, many of you have asked questions around, when are we going to pick up the special education work? Where are we with these fields? Um, what is that going to look like? And I'm happy to share that we are resuming these stakeholder opportunities in the fall uh, with continued discussions related to personnel assignments and course and training, coursework and training requirements. In terms of bilingual education, I'm also excited to share that we have opportunities coming in the fall to discuss, uh, to have discussions related to exam design considerations um, and what those exam design considerations would have the impact that they might have on the field. Uh, so with that, we are going to create an EPSG special populations working group uh, to capture your feedback and get your thoughts and expertise related to these two fields. A survey for interest will be shared with EPSG members in the coming week. Uh, so please look for that again. So those are, so you have your EPSG working group and then we're also going to have this EPSG special populations working group as well. So you have opportunities uh, to engage with staff in, with staff around these fields. And then another kind of shameless plug here, you received an email from me recently, uh, as recent as July 24th, actually, uh, related to our teacher pedagogy and ELAR and math core content pedagogy educator standards advisory committees. Uh, we are currently see seeking applications for these committees. These will be three separate uh, educator standards committees. The application period opened July 24th. Um, and I did share that via email with EPSHI members. This application will close August 25th. Um, and we do plan to share the names of selected committee members with the ESPEC at the upcoming September meeting uh, with the hope that the ESPEC will approve these uh, selected members of the committee so that we can begin work in the fall in drafting standards uh, for each of these fields. Uh, so if you have not already, uh, please take a look at that application. If you are interested or you know folks who might be interested in serving on these committees, please share that information with them. And if you have questions about the application or the standards drafting process, please don't hesitate to uh, reach out to me. And I am done with my portion here. Um, so I'm going to move it on to, I think Ebony's up next. That's me. Thanks to Marco, always a tough act to follow. Um, but I am super excited to be with you all today to talk about the updates to the effective preparation framework. 
and perfect. Okay, so you all have heard lots of updates about the EPF over, I feel like, the past uh, couple of years. And so I'm really excited to introduce the Effective Preparation Framework version 1.0. Um, as we stamp this as that aspirational vision for best practices um, for EPPs. And truly, this was a collaborative effort um, that was for the field and prepared by the field. Um, we had various opportunities for different stakeholders to engage as we really looked at and adapted and developed the EPF. This is in strong alignment with the state vision for both the effective schools and the effective district um, frameworks as well. One thing that you will notice is that this is a 1.0 version um, because as we go forward and we begin to pilot this with the field, we um, understand and know that there's going to be continued opportunities um, to solicit feedback and really to um, adjust based on the lessons that we learned from the field during this piloting year. Um, and so we will have some more information coming out about the EPF version 1.0. And tomorrow, perfect. Um, and so as part of the rollout of the EPF 1.0 during the July ASPEC meeting, um, the ASPEC did direct TEA staff to begin the process really of operationalizing and piloting the EPF in three different ways. Um, the first of which is looking at the redesign of the continuing approval review process. Again, this is in alignment with those aspirational goals of the EPF, being able to dive into quality and being able to provide feedback to EPPs on both areas of strength, as well as opportunities for that continued improvement. The second area um, is to look at vetted third-party technical assistance and professional service providers. Um, again, these would be providers who will be able to provide training and support to EPPs in alignment with the five EPF levers. It also could be utilized by TEA when providing those opportunities for training, um, as well as being used by the SBEC um, when leveraging, again, areas of improvement for EPPs. And then the final directive is looking at updates to the commendations for, um, which is the innovative in the EPP practice, specifically when we are looking to identify and recognize programs that um, implement at the highest level of quality for the EPF. Again, this is just a little bit of teaser um, of what is to come, and so we will have more information and more updates as we continue these processes. Um, in addition to the aspect session where we rolled out the EPF 1.0, the day prior, we were able to have a work session um, that was really informed by the April discussion from the aspect. Uh, during this work session, we had an opportunity to really dive deeply into what um, a quality review process could look like. Um, being able to look at a continuing of a continuing approval review process and look at some examples of what those quality reviews may look like being able to hear from programs that um, this past semester I uh, went through a pilot program themselves and being able to have them speak about uh, their experiences and then the impact on the program as far as planning practices and what those next steps were. And then finally, being able to explore and discuss very early drafts of considerations for the continuing approval review redesign process. Again, we are going to be involved in extensive stakeholder feedback um, as we look at these three areas. And then finally, um, in understanding the work session, um, I must give kudos to those programs that voluntarily open their doors to allow us uh, to really ride alongside them as they underwent a quality review process. Um, so Dallas College, Sam Houston State, Tarleton State, and the University of Houston downtown. All right, and then I will pass it over to Jessica to talk about some of our early draft proposals for redesign. Thanks, Ebony. Um, as, as Ebony named, uh, we had an opportunity in the work session to lay out some very early preliminary recommendations on what a redesigned continuing approval review process could look and sound like. Um, I'm going to narrate over this at, the, at a high level, but just again, another plug for our working groups and continued collaboration. This is really just a starting point of really digging in and refining, um, refining this process. Um, our recommendation overall to the aspect was to consider um, if ASEP, um, as we oftentimes call it, uh, serves as a warning light for programs around areas in which they need to improve, 
um, a recommendation was to take it into consideration connecting to the degree possible ASAP to our continuing approval review process. And so our recommendation was that um, if a program is accredited, they would just continue on in the every five year review cycle, but that if a program fell below the accredited line or demonstrated other risk factors, um, that their continuing approval review would be expedited during the following fall after receiving their assigned accreditation status. Um, the recommendation for the redesigned continuing approval review itself um, would be that this would be a review facilitated by a third party provider with expertise in these types of services and would include for all programs an on-site review that would look at artifacts, observations, focus groups, um, and that would be this uh, review would be facilitated by a team of Texas reviewers. So folks from EPPs, um, LEA staff that were trained and calibrated by this third party reviewer. Um, and really here, uh, this is something that we that we got feedback from uh, the panel around and uh, board members, but this uh, concept of reviewing uh, uh, for both evidence of prioritized compliance items and quality implementation of practices within the effective preparation framework. Um, coming out of that quality review, redesign continuing approval review process, anticipate that it, the review would generate highest leverage areas for programmatic improvement and would be an opportunity to identify EPPs for commendations who received top rubric indicators in a specific lever. Um, coming out of that identification of those areas for improvement, um, the, for accredited programs, there would be opportunities to opt in to partnership with a technical assistance provider who would be on that EPF aligned uh, vetted provider list that Ebony mentioned. And then for those accredited warned and below programs, um, they would be required, um, which is currently within the, the SBEC's uh, sanction authority, um, to partner with a TA provider and develop an action plan to address any compliance items. And really the expectation would be that they would make me measurable progress towards quality indicators. And then finally, um, as programs began to implement their improvement plans for those accredited programs, again, opportunities to opt into statewide training and supports communities of practice as they were available. Um, and then for those accredited warned or below programs, they would be held accountable to meeting benchmarks established in their action plan within a given time frame, really in coordination with their technical assistance uh, or professional services provider. So this is sort of at the 30,000 foot view, sort of the overall recommended flow. Um, again, a lot of nuance in each one of these steps, uh, or frankly, the step overall, and um, that we wanna continue to work with stakeholders on, but we wanted a, at least a starting place um, to begin to engage in discussion um, around what seems like it works, what won't work at all, et cetera, as we move forward. And um, if we can go to the next slide. Um, to that point, in the in the context of the work session um, and discussions with the SBEC, a few things that were raised um, in kind of this first round look at these recommendations. One, there was a, a lot of conversation around, are there opportunities during the review process to give credit or to streamline documents for the review if a program has gone through another type of review recently? So one of the examples that came up was if I just went through national accreditation, is there certain documentation, certain data sets that I could submit that could be then also considered in the context of my continuing approval review? Um, a second uh, kind of wondering that came up would be around, does every program get a review of the entirety of their program? Or if I'm an accredited program, can I identify a more targeted focus area for improvement? Or should the SBEC take a perspective annually around a certain set of quality indicators that they want to review programs on more specifically? So that's sort of an open discussion. We had a lot of uh, fruitful debate on that front um, in the work session, but again, continue to engage with that with stakeholders. Um, third, I think a big thing we heard was this, where is there that balance between compliance um, with the administrative code and the quality review components? Um, where can they speak to each other? Where can we streamline some of the compliance reviews so we give space for this engagement around quality, et cetera? 
Um, and then I think we just heard really clearly from the board and from the working group stakeholders, just to make sure that we're really soliciting feedback and engagement from the field throughout the design process, which is definitely our commitment. Um, so just stamping here, we will circle back to the board in September and provide them an update on, on some more specific timelines and recommendations for engagement with stakeholders and next steps related to the continuing approval review process. And then again, um, a huge shout out again to our, our um, EPSG EPF working group, who was incredibly instrumental in getting us to a place where we now have an EPF version 1.0 in the field. Um, and they have uh, promised me that they are going to continue to engage um, as we move to the next phases of the work, thinking about the redesign of the continuing approval review process. I do know that there's been um, some transitions in the EPSG um, since we originally opened um, this working group to folks. And so um, as DeMarco mentioned, we are gonna send out a survey um, after this call asking for interest in participation in working groups. If you haven't been a participant in the EPF working group, um, to date, but you are interested in engaging in that space as well, um, feel free to check your name by there or reconfirm your participation in that group. And then I think the other thing I would just name is that the EPSG will not be the only place where we are going to engage stakeholders around um, all of these next steps. We anticipate pretty broad, robust stakeholder engagement here. Holly, question? Yes, uh, thanks, Jessica. I. So I know that part of or much of the discussion during the uh, ESPEC meeting and the work session was this notion, this this focus on the fact that the EPF was aspirational, uh -huh. concerns about translating that to a continuing uh, approval review process, and and as a result of that discussion, it seemed that there was interest in someone, and I think I think it's going to end up being EPSG at least to to start that process, identifying what are considered the foundational components of the EPF that would be part of the continuing approval review process. And if I'm understanding that right, then would that be this EPSG working group that would engage in that exercise? I think uh, the EPSG working group would be certainly one of those groups that would engage in this exercise. I think the other thing to name here too is that um, we would be seeking a, a vendor to support in the design and development of the rubrics that we would use to kind of that and evaluate quality here. And so um, also anticipating kind of uh, that vendor also engaging in extensive stakeholder um, uh, feedback throughout sort of the development of those rubrics as well. I think like a frankly an open question that we had to the board was, you know, are the quality indicators really just for the program's information? And we're really only recommending continuing approval based on the compliance components or do we want to take some sort of perspective around uh, our, it's our expectation that programs demonstrate at least this level on the quality rubrics to be recommended for continuing approval? I think that's like a super big open question still and one that we want to really mm -hmm. lean into stakeholders around. And I think will be really important for the EPSG working group to have a perspective on. Okay. But, but those quality indicators would likely be informed by the identification of what consensus is that the foundational components of the EPF are, is that correct? Yes, or like if if these are the aspirational components, what does it look like at its like foundational level? Absolutely. Oh, I see, okay. And then just, just quickly, before we get too far along in this meeting, I just wondered, I actually had some questions about the, the previous item, the, the Texas TPA. And so I didn't know at what point we should interject our questions for each of these items. Is it appropriate to ask that now or should I wait till later or what's the preference? Yeah, I think um, let's, let's cause I know Zach's got a question here too. Let's pause on those. And then if we can circle back around at the end, Holly, to, to talk about text TPA, that'd be great. And then I think, We'll just make sure that we're pausing at the end of each section here to address any yep. questions you'll have. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Zach, thoughts you had, questions? Yeah, I just, I'll go on record while it's recorded. I will always defer my time to Holly. So she can always, she can always 
take take time that I had, but I appreciate the opportunity for questions. I, and Jessica, I just want to make sure I understood. So we would look at having a third party vendor who's got some expertise in programmatic evaluations. They're going to set the benchmarks, the rubrics, but the ultimate ones doing the evaluation would be trained Texas EPP individuals, or at least individuals in Texas that have a working knowledge of EPPs. Is that we've got a vendor setting rubrics, but then the evaluators would be Texas folks, correct? So the, the vendor would, um, so part of the, the expectation would be that the vendor would develop the evaluation tools with Texas stakeholders. And then basically the vendor would be in charge of recruiting, training, calibrating, managing Texas-based EPP and LEA uh, folks who would conduct the reviews. Perfect. Thanks for that clarification. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, then I think that's the end um, of this item. So we'll transition on um, to our discussion around 228. And then Holly will be accountable that we'll circle back at the end for those questions. So y'all, I think before I'll, I'll do the quick intro for, for 228, and we have some uh, wonderful speakers today that are going to share some updates. Dates. Um, we're going to start with uh, Lori giving some exciting updates from the last July SBEC meeting uh, that are sort of specific to the foundational components of 228. Uh, and then I'm excited to hear again updates from Jessica and Melissa about the EPF and teacher residency. And then uh, I'm queuing them up now, so it's not a spoiler alert, but we're going to have the great fortune to hear the uh, most melodic pipes, if you will, of Dr. Zach Rosell. Right after that, we've uh, squeezed in the TSEP recommendations and have a couple of slides there. So we're going to carve out time in this meeting to kind of go over those recommendations. And after we've had an opportunity to have a, a robust conversation there, uh, I'll come back with uh, help from other colleagues to talk about our additional plans between now and the September discussion item for more stakeholder engagement, and then a quick overview again of the 228 uh, timeline for proposed rulemaking. So with that said, I get to go on mute again and hand off to um, Lori Ayers. All right. Thank you. Good morning again, everyone. It's great to see everyone. Uh, so as you know, the, the 228 update has taken several layers. Um, the initial layer was going through reorganizing the rules, adding some more clarity and definition to some of the rules. Um, and then we were overlaying some other pieces like residency on top of that. So we'll, we'll hear about those layers in just a minute. But um, if, if you were at the SBEC, in July um, tuned in, you would have seen the slide. What we did was we provided them with an update on, these are sort of the foundational things that we've worked on and tweaked and updated um, in 228. And so that included some additional definitions, um, more clarity around what an assignment start date is in terms of um, you know, when the clock starts ticking on, on field supervision. Um, more clearly defining a clinical experience because in the um, in the educator certification online system, ECOS entities green screen, you know, there is a, a requirement now to report for clinical experience data. And so just to be clear about what clinical experience is, it's clinical teaching internship um, and practicum. And then the definition for co-teaching as well. And then in the continuing approval reviews as they exist, of uh, the requirement that programs meet an 80% standard for records review uh, to be considered compliant, that has not been codified, but we are codifying it now for transparency. So that, that requirement's not changing. It's just that we're putting it in here for transparency now. And then the exit policy, clarifying, more clearly clarifying that. There was some discussion around an exit policy and those requirements, and so we, we clarified that. There were some additions to the pre-service coursework requirements. So the first 150 hours that candidates must complete before they can begin clinical teaching or internship, teacher candidates, um, we there were a couple of items added to that. Um, and so we pointed those out to the board as well. One was in the use of instructional materials and one was around the um, component 10 requirement. And then um, based on stakeholder feedback, uh, we updated the requirement for candidates who were put on internship extensions. 
So a candidate who was put on an internship extension year because the first internship was unsuccessful. The current rule requires um, the candidate to be put on a plan and basically to work the plan with the program uh, to get better and improve in the next internship. So that's currently existing, but what a some stakeholder feedback suggested that we needed to include mentor feedback in developing that plan to address the deficiencies um, that the candidate can work on during the extension um, year. So we included that and then clarified the time frame that a candidate uh, needs to have the mentor or site supervisor assigned um, when they begin their internship. And then finally, added clarification around training of mentors and site supervisors and cooperating teachers. And what that was, the way the, the rule is currently written, um, the training of those campus personnel has to happen within the first three weeks after the assignment after the candidate starts, we change that to include and before the assignment start date too, to capture opportunities for training before school starts and before the candidate starts the assignment. We had a lot of requests for that over the last year or two, um, and we took this opportunity to update that in, um, in this revision. So those were the things that we highlighted for the board. There wasn't a lot of discussion around that. Um, and so then we we then jumped into what we had overlaid onto TAC that was residency um, and the additional overlays that we put on there. So, and the EPF. So I think the next slide, DeMarco, if you can switch. Yep. Um, so the next slide starts the EPF information that we wove into 228 and um, who's gonna be, let's That's see. That's me, it's, Laurie. Yeah, Thank Melissa. You. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Laurie, for transitioning. So we're mm -hmm. going back to Marilyn's original analogy on this item shared at, in our July meeting. We're on this three-way highway or three-lane highway. Um, and so we're going to shift into that EPF lane that I'll take you over to the residency um, certification pathway. So during July's meeting, a few quick updates here. Um, we coalesced the recommendations um, for, and feedback from the field into these updates for the for um, our board, um, and beginning with um, with four focus areas. Um, so the first one around performance tasks um, made those updates to make sure there was a crystal clear definition of what a performance task is. That it's allowing um, a candidate to really demonstrate a discrete set of skills measured against a clear rubric and, and set of criteria, um, and then it, it clarify the role it plays in the candidate's preparation that um, even prior to clinical experience, um, that candidates are evaluated or are measured against per, uh, using performance tests to ensure that they're demonstrating incremental skill development. Um, Additionally, um, moving forward to the field supervisor role, um, provided some clarification around the use of benchmarks to inform interventions and supports for candidates, right? Like if we're using those benchmark assessments to therefore inform how we support um, um, candidates to move forward in their progression of skill development. Um, and then also um, additional requirements for field supervisors to, um, include um, written feedback during post observation um, during post observations as well as informal um, informal coaching. Um, and then in addition to those formal observation requirements. And then when it comes to um, candidate practice requirements, I think a big resounding area of feedback across the board has been around practice, based um, preparation experiences. What are those? What do they look like? What do they sound like? So the inclusion of um, definitions and examples of what that looks like and sounds like um, as mirrored also in the EPF, right? So a few of those examples include um, uh, defining enactments, analysis, representations as, as those ways in which we support candidates with those pra practice-based um, experiences um, during their preparation experience. And then finally, the fourth area was centered around co-teaching. Um, so just there had been quite a bit of discussion around um, how this is applicable 
to all pathways, right? So if I'm engaging in a, a clinical teaching experience, um, having the opportunity to engage in co-teaching um, with a mentor teacher during my clinical teaching experience, getting that sheltered practice. I will shift into- um, oh, Melissa, before oh, we yeah. move on, I think Holly has a question. Oh, great, thank you. Sorry, <laughs> I'm back. Um, just quickly, so here, you know, this slide is talking about the foundational components of the EPF that are actually being incorporated into chapter 228. And I, this is, I have several questions related to this. First of all, you know, identifying these foundational components of the EPF is also something that I guess the FSG working group and others will do in terms of informing the continuing approval process, right? So my first question is, how did staff arrive at these foundational components? Um, and my second question is, is there a way to tie back these identified foundational components to the actual levers in the EPF so we know where they're coming from? Um, so I'll just stop there. That's, that's kind of one of my questions. And then my other one actually relates back to the CAR. Yeah, Holly, that's a great question. So th these were discussed with the EPSCHE working group. So um, these were all put in front of the EPSCHE working group. We actually asked, are there things that additional foundational components that should be added? Do any of these things need to be removed? Um, we went through iterative rounds of feedback on these. So the feedback that you're going to see in the middle column is feedback that was either from like stakeholders in the board or feedback from the FG EPF working group. So um, that's where these came from. And again, I would clarify that I think I would distinguish between things that are within the EPF that we're saying we want to uh, engage, incorporate into the continuing approval review process as prioritize things to incorporate into the review. Here, the intention was just saying, if within the, if the EPF is our aspirational goal, are there things that we actually just think are, are non-negotiable components that need to be true for every program right now? And so that's what you'll see that like, these are representative of those things to say, listen, if that's the aspirational goal at the like foundational expectation, here's a few things that we either, and most of this is really more about clarifying or adding specificity um, than really doing like wholesale like changes to programmatic requirements. So that's kind of the difference I would say. I think we are using foundational for two different purposes here. So I think we'll think about our language there, but really different intents and purposes. Okay, I appreciate that because I do, I am aware that um, incorporating these things into Chapter 2, 2 a, um may result in these things being compliance indicators for purposes of the continuing approval review process. And so as long as that distinction is clear, as opposed to, um, and like you said, Jessica, it's still an open question about how the quality indicators in the CAR will be used. Exactly. So, yeah, that was definitely um, one of my um, concerns about that. Um, and then, of course, as the this process of, of identifying sort of the quality indicators for the CAR is undergone, um, I know that this came up earlier in this meeting, but also in the SBEC meeting that there's uh, that the that the uh, EPF itself is a living document that could be changed accordingly if, you know, there's a discovery that perhaps this lever um, isn't uh, worded properly or, you know, as a result of this exercise, yeah. so. Exactly, yeah, yeah. we would anticipate it. I think particularly when working with stakeholders around the development of those rubrics, there might be like language that we say that's actually not like precise enough or we need to walk this back. And we think kind of that iterative process will likely inform um, tweaks to the, the EPF as well. Thank you. I just want to, I just want to say, I, I really appreciate staff labeling these things within TAC. I know some of this arose from a conversation in that working group. I remember Donna, you and I going back and forth, um, like asking staff to just label and name the teacher educator practice 
instead of leaving programs to infer. And I just, I just want to commend staff for ingraining this and making it super clear um, for programs. So thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Calvin. Yeah, let's be clear about everything, right? I want to jump in. One thing also about this being the EPF 1.0 is kind of how we're terming it. I do think that some of the technical edits and vocabulary, like if we find that there are more precise ways to, to support that clarity, that is one area that I think we would be constantly looking at just improvement. But I also think if we do discover that there are unintended consequences of something that we're naming, like we're also open there, right? Like when we say that this is a living document, it's so that it itself can model continuous improvement. Um, so just to know that that's, uh, you know, kind of where we're coming from at the as staff. That makes a lot of sense I, for me. And also like, I could imagine maybe in the future for some of these terms, like maybe there's a, a resource with examples. Um, like for example, when you say like, um, I, I know this because I think that this was my feedback, but enactments or analysis representations, like providing examples would be really helpful, I think, for programs. Absolutely, Calvin. We have an opportunity to do that, too, um, with um, a set of like resources um, that we'll be gearing up to um, for that EPF 1.0 rollout as well. So it's a great point. Awesome. Uh, we'll move on to the residency track or lane on the highway. Before we take a look at um, what we discussed on the 21st, um, just backing up a little bit, on the 20th, we also had the opportunity to engage in a work session around the teacher residency um, pathway and um, during that time, we were able to work with the SBEC members to engage in a comparison of those draft teacher residency pathway components that have been shared across several board meetings now um, as compared to existing pathways and um, in comparison to teacher uh, residency program quality components that were that are research based. Um, in addition to that, the majority of the time was spent um, engaging with a panel of teacher residency programs and their partners. Um, I'll, I'm going to name them here really quickly. We had Dallas College and Richardson ISD. We had Sam Houston State and Klein ISD. We had um, U University of Texas El Paso and Socorro ISD. And then we also had Tarleton State University and Huckabee ISD come to the table and spend the morning with us. Um, and, and board members had an opportunity to engage with the panel around such topics as um, the actual process of residency transformation and those part in building those partnership foundations, um, they discussed kind of got under the hood of that clinical teaching experience during the residency program, the scope and sequence of training, um, and just the connection, how all those pieces synthesize and fit together um, in in evaluating and determining a candidate's readiness. Um, Additionally, um, programs and their partners provided impact on um, success um, in, in field placement, what those instructional settings look, have looked like for candidates, what's worked, what's been challenging. Um, and they also provided um, a discussion around um, field supervisor and mentor teacher selection, training, um, processes that they've engaged in. And of course, um, discussed how, how they go about measuring candidate readiness to progress um, throughout their residency year and to be determined as, as ready and fit to teach. Um, and then finally, um, also talked about um, the way in which shared governance practices um, where partnerships come together to really look at the right pieces of data to make informed decisions about the programs and um, how that really is the catalyst and, and the glue that's, that's holding a lot of um, of the progress and success together. So really robust um, conversation with our program it programs and their and their district partners. Um, and just again, gratitude to those who who joined us that day. Can move to the next one. Great. Um, a few takeaways um, from that work session that that resonated. Um, just I think the first one here or on this concept of transfer, transformation to a teacher residency program, um, that it's not easy um, and that it requires 
reallocation and reinvestment of funding, resources, staff um, on behalf of the program. It's a lot of work for programs um, and their partners too who have who have bought in to build these quality residency models. Um, but it programs and their partners emphasized over and over again that the efforts, um, despite being a work, um, were worth it in the and they are seeing those results. Um, they also emphasized and our board emphasized too the importance of mentors and the related selection training um, and training practices and of course retention of those mentors to as being keys to strong programs. Um, Additionally, a lot of talk about partnership practices. Um, a district partners and EPPs emphasize that these partnerships have been mutually beneficial um, and that districts believe that they play an incredibly critical role um, in making sure that that program is successful on the ground. Um, partners also noted a, a particular investment in teacher residents as, as um as playing a role too in their overall talent strategy, seeing that resident as an investment, as someone they're training as one of their own staff, and um, and it versus um, having it st traditional student teachers placed on a campus where they just hadn't done um, that strategic planning before around how do I retain this, how am I going to retain this teacher, how do I want to train this um, potential teacher to um, remain in my district. Um, and then and a few other areas, um, of course, that 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 surfaced as well were around the emphasis of strong planning for candidate performance gates, measuring that incremental uh, skill development of candidates throughout the program. And then, of course, the related responsiveness to a candidate's needs. Um, and then finally, um, one other key point I would draw out here um, is um, this concept of learning from strong practices um, and just emphasizing that um, supporting and defining this teacher residency pathway um, could have potential to, to really strengthen all available preparation pathways. Um, just if we clarify, um, if, this, if, this, if this is an aspirational approach, how, how can that um, be a less a learning space for all? Thank you, Demarco. Um, and so that kind of that kind of relates very closely to some of those key discussion areas um, in in our July twenty twenty three um, board meeting with our um, our SBEC. And these were also grounded in stakeholder feedback um, from the field. And um, between the April and July meeting, we had a chance to meet with districts who are currently engaged in teacher residency. Um, implementation as well as um, vetted teacher residency programs um, around some key ideas that that had surfaced as questions. So just to highlight a few of those here, um, discussed addition to chapter 228 around um, clarification that there should be documentation of a, of a shared agreement between um, the district partner and the EPP when, when a decision is made um, for a candidate to be a placed in more than one instructional field uh, instructional setting during their um during their clinical teaching year. So should a candidate be placed in two settings, um, there should be a strong coherent agreement across those two entities um, that it is what is best for the candidate. Um, we also provided some updates and clarification um, related to field supervisor requirements, particularly as they pertain to um, the previous requirements for um, meetings and engagement with campus administration, wanted to provide um, kind of a broader um, definition so that it was more inclusive of collaborative supports, such as co-observation, co-coaching of the candidate, and, um, and, and other calibration experiences for interrelator reliability when it comes to supporting that candidate's development before it read as three meetings. And that, that felt like, intentional as it could be. So update that language to make that more intentional and really centered on the candidate's development. Um, we also included that the engagement could be both virtual or in person, again, adding to some of that flexibility um, for those field supervisor requirements. Um, the other area, and this is this is this has been the big one um, since the beginning and rightly so, because it is so critical. Um, 
really has the conversation has really continued to center around determining candidate readiness. Um, so we've included here this the conversation about the certification exam requirement um, um, around um, just the, the ASPEC has continued to emphasize that there needs to be really clear um, and high a high bar for determining and measuring a candidate's readiness. Um, and has reinforced to the importance that um, a candidate, or sorry, excuse me, a program's um, approval to offer a residency certificate, um, that that approval rubric should have very clear criteria for what those performance gates and benchmark assessment requirements would look like and it, what, what that criteria is to make sure that programs are putting forth very strong um, performance assessments. Um, and then the final area was around the addition related to the evaluation of a teacher candidate's readiness um, was the addition of instructional dimension 2.3 communication, which um, to the original set of um, proposed um, performance standards to determine a candidate's readiness um, and both um, districts and EPPs felt like that was a pretty foundational um, um, instructional dimension to also include in that list. And oh, so, oh, I see uh, Holly. Oh, Holly, yes. Hands. Thank you for watching the hands. Not a problem. <laughs> And I, I, at the risk of being accused of overusing my my hand, I you're all good. Apologize in advance. I I thought the board discussion about this I this concept of whether a candidate should have to take uh, the a pedagogy exam uh, or not was interesting. I I wondered what staff's sense was on where they are with it because I got the feeling that. that there's still some hesitancy among the board members about mm -hmm. completely exempting residents from having to take a pedagogy test. And I felt like that was reflected in the discussion about who informs what those performance gates are. Um, and I know that both uh, Chair Streepy and uh, Member Murray uh, expressed the desire for SBEC to have some input on what those performance gates are rather than programs being able to wholesale define those themselves. And I know Jessica tried her best <laughs> to talk about the approval rubric and the board standards being set out um, and, and that the fourth performance gate would be based on those T-test dimensions that are listed in the rule. But it's it still felt like the board wanted to is still not completely comfortable with with this notion. And I just wanted to get y'all sense on that. I think that's the right read, Holly. And I think, yep. um, you know, I think what we heard from the board is we want to see what these rubrics look and sound like for approval of the program. And that would give them a like better sense on what their directive would ultimately be to staff. So I think that's what, um, you know, we're hard at work on, on continuing to develop in consultation with stakeholders. And so I think, you know, again, this has been sort of an open question with the board. We anticipate it continuing to be an open question, at least through the September meeting, where we get to kind of dig into those materials further. And then really, we'll just be seeking our guidance onto, uh, onto the, what the approach they want um, us to pursue moving forward. And do you anticipate bringing those rubrics to the board in September? We the, do. Yes. Yes. Approval rubrics. Okay. Okay. Yes. Thank you. I was going to say, Kelly, that's the perfect segue to um, next steps. Great. Um, so these these are some of so Holly to your point. Um, so first, if the first uh, next step we we need to take here is to engage with um, that draft residency program approval rubric to really provide that clarity that Jessica just spoke to, right? Like here is here is the bar for determining program quality. Um, and then um and then of course like with the emphasis in ensuring that 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 verification of candidate readiness to teach and other critical quality indicators, um, quality components are very clearly laid out there. Um, and then in that in that development in that process, we'll be continuing to gather stakeholder input from 
um, established pro residency programs and district partners regarding implications and challenges with these criteria and also with um, some, some initial feedback around these uh, continued clarification around those components. Um, and some of these some of these concepts here were just presented from or were raised during the meeting um from from testimony etc questions from the board so a few examples were around the number of clinical placement per hours per week um in to still strike that balance of flexibility but without com compromising that quality of the clinical experience and then there was one caveat around what do we do about sick days those types of you know um consequential pieces that come into place um and then finally and then also um the definition of the year with the start and end date. So there were a couple concept questions that came up um, throughout the meeting that we'll, we'll address with stakeholders as well. Um, and a, a couple more pieces too that came up from our board um, and from and from the from both work session and the meeting on Friday. Um, clearly still the need to revisit the name of that certificate. Um, and also um, the board expressed interest in gaining more understanding around secondary residency practices, um, particularly related to scale efforts, barriers, challenges, et cetera. So those were just a few um, follow-ups ahead of September's meeting. I think I'm over to Marilyn. Thanks. Actually, I can, jump. I, I can jump in, Marilyn. I'm happy okay, to sure. transition. Yeah. So um, we are really grateful that the um, we had some recommendations presented to the board in this meeting related to FBE requirements. We did commit to would um, have those recommendations pre presented to EPSCHE for uh, their feedback and do anticipate incorporating uh, those recommendations into future draft language. So um, <clears throat> we asked someone from that group uh, to come and share them directly with you. I think Zach, uh, either drew the short straw or drew the longs. I don't know if this was a, a you were voluntold or you volunteered, Zach, but I'm happy for you to just tell us a little bit about the process and then share uh, at a high level what the recommendations um, y'all are proposing are. Yeah, thanks for that, Emily. In all fairness, we had all-star Liz Ward ready to go, but she could not make the meeting. And so you're exactly right. I did get the short straw. But I am one of a few representatives for the Texas uh, Educator Coalition for Preparation and, and, and where I like to provide clarity, I'd, I'd love for other representatives to step in there, but I will try my best. We've been meeting for quite some time now, thinking about the revisions in 228. We appreciate staff, the way that it's been done and um, categorized for ease of read, for ability to find things. And so as we met as a group, we were thinking of what are some low barriers to entry where we can make some changes that programs could step into with a long-term vision of where we want to be headed um, with providing additional quality, additional rigor, and ultimately having um, a, a tangible outcome for the teachers in the classroom as it affects student learning. And so these were just kind of some things that we had worked together to throw out when we look at the field-based hours prior to uh, an internship or clinical experience as it sits at 30, looking at increasing those to 50 hours, and then with that increase to 50 hours, uh, where we still have the split of allowing for virtual and in-person, we just increase that to mirror what we currently have. Right now with 30 hours, 15 and 15, when we move to 50, go to 25 and 25, still allowing that flexibility for um the the virtual or video observations and so that was our thought here just going from 30 hours to 50 we do have some long-term vision of going even higher in that but thought 50 was a good step in that direction uh dr sterling always happy to entertain questions um so first let me start with i i love increasing hours because the more i think we do something the better we get at it absolutely um i just was curious if the group had thought about anything, an addition, like outside of just the hours, like anything that would also be able to be added to make sure that like our candidates are fully ready to jump into the classroom other than the increased hours, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I think overall, you know, just as a, a an overall vision, we were looking at what makes the candidates most classroom ready. We've got some different recommendations that are intertwined. 
when we looked at the observation or the field based observation hours, uh, we we like what's in rule and, and given what the intentionality is to see diverse settings, to be multiple placements. Uh, but really, when we were looking, taking what we have in place, going up to 50, we didn't get into the nitty gritty weed specifics of what is currently in 228. Do those need to be expanded upon? or gone into more depth other than just looking at increasing the hours right now. As a group, we do have a long-term vision of moving even to more substantial hours uh, for field-based experience. Uh, and at that point, I think it'd be well-received to kind of look at what types being more codified, more specific, and what those observation hours can, can entail. But at this initial go, Christina, we didn't get, we didn't make any recommendations to those changes that are currently in rule. Does that help answer your question? Yes, it does. And I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, of course. Calvin. Yeah, uh, to, to the likes of uh, what Dr. Sterling was saying, I really appreciate the push um, around FBE. And I was wondering, like, I think one of the things that we know is that, that the field-based experiences can be really meaningful if they're connected to sound and research-backed pedagogical practices that the candidates learning in their for example, their pre-service. So did you all give any consideration around like the pre-service hours and, and how those make connections or how that relates to, for example, like the intensive pre-service option? No, we didn't get into to those specifics. What we tried to do, and I think it's coming up in a couple of slides, is uh, take steps towards that. Calvin, I, 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 I like where you're thinking, and I think it's appropriate. We were looking at tying those initial field-based experience hours to be grade band specific. So we're getting a little bit more clarity on the certification area that they're seeking is actually what they're observing in during those field-based hours. So you wouldn't have a secondary chemistry teacher observing elementary music, trying to, to kind of streamline and narrow that in. But we we didn't again, we didn't get into touching the finer points of the pre-service hours. Yeah. I think all that's great. We're uh, certainly willing and want to go deeper in. We're looking at for right now, let's let's start moving towards that uh, that direction. And again, these weren't meant to be uh, final in their recommendation, but at least a conversation starter and then okay. moving towards, I think where we all want to go more rich pre-service opportunities, better observation candidates, more prepared before they step foot into that classroom on that first day. So those are, yeah. these are great. It's great feedback. We, we just haven't gotten that far into the weeds. Yeah. 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 Well, as you all consider um, kind of moving into that space, I think just like a couple of things, like number one is like, obviously the connection to the pre-service hours. Yes. Um, and then, and, and maybe even considering like, I really like the intensive pre-service language. I feel like it's under leveraged uh, in, in our state. And then I think number two is like thinking about those observations. Like I know at Teaching Excellence, we we ran, uh, we did uh, 17 observations um, and they were on more iterative walkthrough cycles. And I just think like, I think that's maybe an area for you all to consider as well as you make recommendations. Like how can you increase the amount of um teacher educator interaction that an intern has or a candidate has so yeah no that's good and this might be an offline discussion i'd love to how prescriptive those 17 observations were like if they were scaffolded up that would be really good information to have yeah, yeah. um so but yeah we can we can visit about that offline but you're you're thinking the same way we were absolutely uh kevin thanks zach uh Oops. i'm probably beating I'm probably beating a dead drum, but you know, y'all know I don't talk a whole heck of a lot in these meetings, but this is a space I know teachers want new peers that are that have had experiences that they're having and then have the experience to ask the right questions. And so I do love the increase in the number of hours. I'm I'm always for uh, rigor in that regard. I wonder though, people have mentioned this, what qualitative components can we add to this? Are there a number of different uh types of experiences that we could embed um you know the 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 
I just don't see a quality component, um, and it's all um, all numbers. And as we keep talking about high quality, I just like to be able to see that in in that piece. Again, and no shade to the recommendations. I like yeah. numbers, um, but uh, what can we do to add the quality piece? Yeah, I, I think that's a good question. It's well received. I think we would. I mean, ultimately, I'd probably defer a little bit to staff about expanding what those appropriate types of field-based experience hours are uh, and putting, you know, within that section of rule, more prescriptive measures of of what they look like. Um, that would be where I would probably start, but I think that's a, a well-received recommendation, Kevin. I see Lori's hand up also. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, I normally answer questions from Lori, so if... <laughs> Yeah, usually I'm asking you questions. Um, so I do have a question about the third one, about the long-term sub. I actually was the one that put the tech considerations there in parentheses to remind me to ask that question. Yeah. So I wasn't clear if this was asking to remove that option that someone who has been a long-term substitute could use some of those hours as field-based experience hours, or if you were suggesting that we change the number from up to 15 to up to 25. So the recommendation would be to keep the number at 25, but to allow substitute. So to, to broaden it a little bit more than just the long-term sub, given that long-term sub has that 30 consecutive days, but if an individual has been a substitute leading out to still allow that to take part as some of those 25 hours or part of the 50, but they could get 25 hours as a substitute and just not the limitation of a long-term sub. If they were a long-term sub, great, but where they didn't serve it as a codified long-term sub still allow those substitute hours to count. That was the intention. Okay. Thank you. Well, we'll take a look at that, that, that long-term sub rule is in education code. Education and code. so, uh -huh. yeah, we, we can take a look at that and see what the flexibilities are there. Yep. Thank you. Of course, yeah. So that kind of hits up these first initial recommendations regarded to field-based experience before we move to the next slide. I don't see any other questions. Good to go. Um, when looking at internship requirements, our recommendation was regardless of the certification type, whether it be intern or probationary, that everyone be required to have five formal observations. Um, I'm sure as many of you know, the, only, the difference in an intern and a probationary certificate, the probationary requires the PPR, but still our thought, especially as a practitioner, even if they've had the PPR, more support that they can get formally from their field supervisor, the better. And you know, feedback we receive from the field, most programs, even if they're on an intern or probationary, are providing those five formal observations in the uh, for those first year teachers anyway. Uh, then there's just a lot of rule cleanup that we recommended. If you've moved to five formal observations, regardless of certification type, making sure they all align. Um, moving the first formal observation from six weeks to four, just so that they've got that additional support a little bit sooner. Um, and then while there is a virtual option for uh, a virtual means or methodology for the observation, making sure that the first observation be in person, when we thought with the field making the first and then potentially the last in person so that you've got that rapport that's been established and then on the back end when they're getting all the sign offs, having that done. And then something that would be new to the extent possible where a formal observation is done in collaboration with both the field supervisor and the campus administrator, but having those done at the same time. Um, so that was kind of looking at what would it look like for the intern in terms of observation and then requirements for in-person and then alongside. Dr. Sterling. Um, mine is more of a cheerleading this time. I'm loving the new ad because that is something that I know teachers struggle with in terms of the different viewpoints of a coach and an admin on campus. And so for them to have to collaborate on one, I think would be such an added value to the feedback that the teacher would get. So I just wanted to like out loud kudos that one. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. Holly. 
Hi. Yeah. Thanks, Zach. You're doing a great job. I, I just back to the um, substitute and Lori's um, the discussion you had with Lori. Um, I'm looking at the document that we, you know, where the actual struck through and added language on it. And I think you mentioned this earlier, but um, what with regard to the substitute ex field based experience being able to count. Mm -hmm. for the 25 up to 25 clock hours we also sort of balanced you know even though we're taking out the long-term sub um attribute then we sort of balanced it with this additional language that wasn't i don't think reflected on the slide that the field-based experience of that substitute must match the grade band area being sought for initial certification so i just wanted to say we put in we we take it away and we add it to yeah. sort of balance out those different aspects. And Holly, that's a great point. Remind me again too, if you got the document pulled up, isn't there also a timeline on when the experience needed to take place? For the we're we're not looking at substitutes from oh, ten it's years a, ago, right? Yeah, it's either after the candidate's admission to an EPP or during the two years before their admission to an EPP. Yeah. yeah. That's 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 current rule. Mm -hmm. That's current rule. Yeah. Oh, that's current. Okay. Yeah, that's current rule. So we didn't change any of that. We just mostly were wanting a little more flexibility in terms of the field experience for substitutes, and that's why we added. Even though we took away the thirty consecutive days, we added in that it had to be in the grade band area of uh, or level of the certificate being sought. Thanks for that clarification, Holly. If there's no other questions, I think this page is pretty well been highlighted. I, I was real quick, Zach, sorry. No. Uh, going back to the requirement for the first formal observation to occur in the first four weeks, could you mm -hmm. share a little bit about the rationale for that recommendation and where that came from? Yeah, gosh, Kelvin, that's a good, good question. We went back and forth of how quickly we wanted that formal observation. And I mean, it was a matter of days. The thought was just six weeks. When when I did a little bit of pulling from our own I teach program data, we if we were going to get a resignation from a current teacher in the field, uh, they typically came within six weeks. Uh, and so because they were overwhelmed, and these were particularly for our late hires that are stepping into a situation. And so the, the intention is, you know, while our field supervisors make that initial point of contact, getting them in the classroom to see what the makeup looks like, what the situation is firsthand, the sooner that can be done, the better. I mean, we, we went as far as, does it need to be as quick as 10 days, two weeks, thought four weeks provide some flexibility there, but ultimately, uh, Calvin, what we wanted to do was get field supervisor in that classroom setting so they can see when they're having those conversations, give me what's going on, what's your setting look like, what's the campus look like, give me the background of the kids, the sooner they can be having that formal observation, the better. So that was really the intention of just trying to, to move that up a little bit than waiting six weeks. I really appreciate that sentiment. And um, I would even push us to think about, and I think like this is one of the challenges with having the formal observation as the mechanism by which a field supervisor sees a candidate. And if we were to expand that, for example, I put in the chat to like walkthroughs, like could we imagine a world where the program does a walkthrough within those first like days to your mm -hmm. point, like, you know, to build up, you know, to, to, to build on that a little bit, um, which I know we have the initial contact requirement, right. but um and it wouldn't force the program to expend so many, so much resource, right, for a full 45 minute observation, rather a quick touch point walkthrough, et cetera, to ensure that candidates like aren't resigning because they can't manage the classroom yeah. or facilitate strong routines and procedures. So really appreciate the sentiment around this. Yeah, thank you. Lori, I saw your hand go up. Yeah, I just put it in the chat instead. Y'all were having a great conversation and I just put it in the chat. We had, we had received earlier stakeholder feedback also along the lines of bumping that first observation 
um, up earlier than six yeah. weeks. Um, and so this is, you know, seems to be a sentiment shared by, by others as well. So thank you for that. Yeah. So that's what we got. Um, you know, Holly Gina, if I set his back 10 steps, please take us forward. Um, but again, the intentionality was what does it look like to start moving forward to get us even more rigor? Um, and again, it's not that we we don't want to get there, but what do these steps look like for uh, moving programs along as specifically related to pre-service uh, and making sure we're classroom ready? That's all I got. Okay, back to me then. Thank you so much for that. That was that was a lot of great information and insights. So you know, I appreciate hearing that. Um, so one of the things that we still need to think about with regards to the implementation of 228 is, is what we're thinking of and kind of calling here internally as the implementation runway. So, you know, there are aspects of the 228 updates that are just clarification of things that are already there. They're updating rule around um, uh, around some things that programs are already currently doing. But there are also some things that we've included in here that you've heard about today and that you can see as you review the updates that are that are that um, have been added, that there are some areas that programs may need a little bit more implementation time to get those up and going effectively. And so one of the things that, that we we're asking you to think about as an advising group is, uh, is around the time needed for EPP process updates and also internal training in the EPP. So there are some areas of update that may require the EPP internally to want to provide, develop and provide some training to their internal staff on the implementation on those. Um, and then also if there's time needed for curriculum development. So we know that for some curriculum development may be quick and for some others, it may take a while to get curriculum updated and approved and implemented in your EPP. So those are kind of the areas that we're thinking may need some attention to what kind of an effective uh, implementation date do we wanna put on these updates. Um, and then we also want to continue to gather some stakeholder feedback on that, but we would love to hear from the folks on this group. Um, if you could provide us with some reflections and respond to us and give us some input on what you see as some places where we might need to think about extending an implementation effective date uh, for some of the some of the areas of updates that might take a little bit more time for the EPPs to get in place. So what we're gonna ask you to do is think about the updates and identify if you think there are some specific sections of 228 that would benefit from a phased implementation date to ensure that the EPPs and candidates are ready um, for these new requirements. And then also how you think you know, more time would be beneficial to all involved and if you if you have some ideas about what those timelines would look like, then please feel free to provide that. If you could email Marilyn or me um, with that, hopefully by Friday, August 25th, that would be very helpful. That way we can compile that input and have it ready to go when we need it for um, the next discussion. And Holly, I see that you have your hand up. Yes, I do. Thank you, Lori. So I and I I think this notion of phased implementation is is smart and makes sense. And I thought Marilyn gave a good example during the meeting about maybe, you know, the complaints process could go it could start sooner than some of the other sections, for example. I think the there was a slide at the meeting that talked about the proposed implementation timeline for chapter two two eight such that it would be um, adopted and effective in June, July 2024. And if that's the case, would, it's more a procedural question, would the 
even though the chapter itself would be adopted and effective at that time, within that would there be specified effective dates to reflect phased in implementation for certain sections of rules. Y yes, ma'am. You, it is like you are in the office next to me. So I'm going to ask the famous slide <laughs> oh. DeMarco Petrie to go to the next slide because that was our one. Again, we wanted to bring forward the, the one we used with the, the board, with the rulemaking timeline. And Holly, on this slide, um, I think it it's important for us to anchor like 9124 as okay. a starting date for effectiveness. But yes, correct to your point. The sections and the feedback that's going to be helpful to inform us is in those sections, much like if you think about when we implemented principal's instructional leader or the intern in the probationary, and we had language written in the rules, effective or beginning 9-1 of this year, these requirements, that's some of the language internally that we've been talking about where to apply that in which portions of the rules to make sure it's clear and that programs have that clarity of guidance as to we see what's coming down the pike, but this is when the clock, if you will, starts counting for a runway. And then also because we're folding in the components of EPF and residency across all of our teams, we're trying to be thoughtful and think backwards from a date and then going, what's a realistic timeline to give folks, to your point, um, several of the ESPEC board members in the circle have reminded us consistently, think about the things that programs and candidates need to do. And at the same time, all of us, you know, agree, someone who's currently in progress to make sure they have time to finish the path that they're currently in and get certified. So yes, all of those are things that we want to take into consideration as we're writing the rules. Um, we've been kind of going along and getting really great feedback for the sections and internally, that's been a conversation we've continued to look at to go, is this something that could be ready to go immediately for a program, but to be super conscientious about, you can't just snap your fingers and have this done tomorrow. So I, I appreciate you raising that and keeping us um, very honest uh, and open about our thought processes there. Thank I you. And so, so the Marilyn, uh, Marilyn so then it, it is, is it possible that there might be certain effective dates that are even after September 1st, 2024. Yes. yes. Okay. Gotcha. Yes. That's that's yes. what kind of the main thing I was interested in. Okay. I would say, Holly, the effective date is really the like when, you know, the rule gets updated with the Texas register, et cetera. But we would right. have, I think you've seen examples in other rules where we say yeah. we actually have a rule provision that says a new implementation date. And just yes. to name the 9 1 mirrors what we did in the last round of 228 rulemaking, just to make sure we didn't have any changes within an ASAP calendar year. Um, so it's really just trying to like align up with any changes would uh, apply to the next um, ASAP calendar. Yeah, I think that's a really important point as far as getting it in the rule so that we signal to the field, this is a real thing and it is really happening. And these pivots are, you know, not theoretical. Um, so we're trying to balance, right? Like the signaling so that programs have enough time to actually make the changes that they need to without it being an undue burden that will actually, you know, again, have unintended consequences. So that's that's what we're trying to do here. Zach, you had your hand up. Yeah, just real quick. Do y'all know, help remind me, the date of the SBOE meeting in April? Is... We don't have more, a isn't it... calendar, but it's traditionally towards the, the end of the month of April, like mid middle to end of the month yeah. of April. And then we should it would know be... that in December, uh, Zach. Yeah. No, and... September. We should know those in September. And then it's 30 days after they meet that the rule could be effective, correct? So Zach, yep. So that's where we can actually implement a delayed effective date um, in the rulemaking. And so that right. would be the proposal. So same thing we did with last round of 228. We actually, the board passed it well in advance of a September 1 effective date, but um, we actually named that date in the rulemaking to make it really clear to the field about that transition. Perfect, thanks for, thank you for walking me through that. Absolutely. I think that's, I think that's all we have for this one. Just again, you know, thanks to you folks for continuing to offer the feedback. Um, it is gonna be a discussion item again in September. We will get to incorporate um, 
more colors in the rule text. So I'm having Crayola love all the way around as we start to talk about things that have changed since we last presented the document uh, to the board. We're gonna keep with the color coding again uh, for transparency there and updates uh, in the September version of the discussion item. Um, but everything else, just an assurance again, I think you all know this, but it, it it's always nice to say it out loud again. Our internal team is talking to each other constantly and working together. Uh, we're, we're appreciative of your feedback and, and we'll reach out when we have questions and certainly continue to capitalize on opportunities. I could never do the uh, shameless plug as smoothly as DeMarco Petrie, um, but certainly in those opportunities where we can get you and tap your talents, we wanna do that. Um, but thank you all for everything that you've done and, and are continuing to do to work with us through this process. I think with that, that's my spill and I get to pass it over to um, the wonderful and most talented uh, Emily Garcia. Thank you so much, Marilyn. So we just wanted to, uh, First, thank everybody for their time today. Let you know that we are looking at, I think the next slide actually has the dates on it, maybe. Yep, looking um, here at the dates, these are the 2023. So we still have our September 29 meeting. We'll be meeting with this group again on October 20th. And then December 8th, and we'll be meeting with this group on January 19th. Um, at the September 29th SBEC meeting, we will be proposing a set of dates for uh, the 2024 calendar year. So we'll be able to extend this list to include the EPSU meetings. Um, into the 2024 year past that January date. But as soon as we know, you will know. Uh, next slide, please. And it is time if you guys have any other questions. I don't know, uh, Holly, did we we need to circle back to your TPA question or we already got that one? I think we need to circle back. We haven't had a chance, Holly. So if you okay, want to ask great. Yeah, just making sure I didn't miss it. Yep. So Holly, do you want to uh, ask that question? Sure, thank you. Um, so back to the Texas TPA um, content, the during the board meeting, there was and appreciate staff bringing it back to the board for more discussion about this notion of uh, design parameter being that it had to be um, content specific and grade banded pedagogy. Uh, pedagogy test um the uh I, I the board was you know there at that point there weren't that many of them there <laughs> and they were tired and um it, you know it seemed that there was chair streepy sort of canvassed the board about how they felt about it one of the concerns that came up with that about going in that direction was the ability to develop all those tests that it would take within the timeline, the implementation timeline that staff was presenting to the board. And I know Jessica, you responded that one approach y'all were thinking about, and this is what I wanted to ask about, was potentially designing a base set of rubrics, right? It to build off of, I guess, or to go forward. So that was that was really my question is could you elaborate on what that what that would look like or what that means. Certainly. So I think I, and again, you know, we are building initial parameters and we'll work with um, ultimately the IHG or IHEs that are selected to develop the assessment. But, but one approach is we've been doing some like market research around um, to inform our procurement. So we've seen um, some examples of where you build one foundational rubric and then you customize specific sections of the rubric, a sets of rubrics um, to have a more content specific focus. Um, so, you know, we in Texas have our research based instructional strategies in reading and math. And so could see ways that we have sort of like a foundational set of rubrics and then customize those further to intentionally integrate um, those specific content-based um, instructional look for. So that's, again, one kind of a, initial approach that we're thinking through, um, but will certainly benefit from continued input from stakeholders throughout that development process. And, and when you refer to these uh, instructional strategies for reading and math, I'm, I'm not sure I know what you're referring to there. Yeah, so I think um, as an agency, um, we've been providing training and support across the state around research-based instructional strategies. Um, and then I think, you know, 
we have an opportunity. I think there's been a, a strong perspective around the value of content specific pedagogy. Um, I think some of these conversations uh, across the state around the, the value of high quality instructional materials and how those have a, a content pedagogical focus to them. I think there's just been a, a pretty significant push across the state to really think about uh, taking that content specific lens. And um, there's resources that the state's developed kind of in alignment there, but I think more works to come. But again, I think that's where uh, conversations with stakeholders will be important. Okay, and then I know that <laughs> Then the, the sort of corollary discussion that took place was, uh, I know that uh, Member Rodriguez asked about um, the implementation timeline and was expressing concern about the ability, given that timeline, to um, be prepared for uh, the, the year that the uh, ED TPA would be implemented. And so asked about the process going forward uh, for this proposal. And there was discussion about whether it would be brought back as a discussion item in September or a proposal in September. And <laughs> Chair Streepy said, I, I believe that um, unless she, you know, she sort of left it open, but it sounded like, I guess I'm wondering, is it going to be a proposal in September or will it still be a discussion item? Hey, Holly, that's a great question. Yeah, we're still working with Chair Street Breed to set the agenda, okay. so I, I don't have an answer to that question yet. Okay. Okay, does that take care of all of our questions? Does anybody else have any questions for the good of the group? Well, I want to, on behalf of the team, thank everybody for their time and engagement this morning. Um, really appreciate all of the expertise that, that we get to learn from when we join these calls. Um, so thank you for your time. Hope you have a wonderful weekend and manage to stay cool and hydrated um, and look forward to connecting with you guys very, very soon. Take great, take great care. Good luck to any parents who have kids going back to school next week. Best of luck. You'll be in our prayers and our thoughts. <laughs>